the classical encryption techniques that we've introduced are just there to illustrate some of the concepts used in encryption. The classical techniques were first, the Caesar cipher is maybe 2,000 years old. And the other ones uh, used in the maybe the Vision Air cipher uh, in the 1900s, early, early 1900s, early last century. So they're, they're quite old, before computers. But now we have uh, computerized algorithms. We're going to operate everything not on English characters, we're going to operate on binary characters. So we're going to operate on zeros and ones. So all of our examples from now on will be looking at bits. And the, we're going to move into the real ciphers, the one that have been used, uh, I guess, over the last 40 years and up until today. And we're going to use DES, the data encryption standard, as a, as a detailed example, but then mention a few other ciphers. And these are uh, real ciphers being used uh, for computer-based encryption. And we're going to focus on block ciphers. So let's talk about what we mean by block ciphers. In fact, we can def split our ciphers into two types, block ciphers and stream ciphers. First, well, what is the difference? In, in simple view, it's the amount that they encrypt each time. Our encryption algorithms don't encrypt the entire file at once. They operate on usually a fixed length of bits or bytes. And the difference between stream ciphers and block ciphers, one part is that stream ciphers usually operate on a small number of bits at a time, block ciphers on a slightly larger number of bits. A stream cipher normally encrypts either one bit or one byte at a time. So we take a byte of plain text, encrypt it, and then apply the same encryption algorithm on the next byte, and the same algorithm on the next byte, and keep going. And it, to complete our encryption of a file or a stream of data. Or a, block cipher, a block cipher, we'll see on the next slide, does the same thing, but it operates on a slightly larger set of bits, usually 64 bits, 8 bytes, or 128 bits. So it's a, the length of input which they operate on, but it's, the algorithms used to do the encryption have been designed slightly differently, such that the stream ciphers, the aim was to do the encryption fast. So a stream cipher encrypts a, a stream of one bit or one byte at a time. So you can think we've always got data we want to encrypt. It's coming in, a stream of bits are coming in to our encrypting device, and the stream cipher needs to encrypt those bits as fast as possible so that the cipher text comes out. And people designed the algorithms to do the encryption such that it was fast, fast compared to the block ciphers we'll see in the next approach. And the common approach that was used for stream ciphers, and still is, is that we have plain text coming in, think a continuous stream of bits coming in to encrypt. We have a key. We have some algorithm that generates uh, from that key a random stream of bits, called a cryptographic bit stream here, but essentially takes this key and generates random numbers as output. So to encrypt, we take the plain text bits, the random number, represented in binary, and exclusive all the values, XOR. And what comes out is, is the ciphertext. The benefit of this approach, if you have a good algorithm to generate random bits from a key, is that exclusive OR is very fast to implement in hardware and software. Okay, so when we have um, plain text coming in and we want to encrypt it in real time, maybe we want to encrypt a voice call as someone was speaking, they're generating bits for them from their voice, they, they, they speak into their uh, speaker on their phone, their phone converts that to bits and then the software needs to encrypt those bits before they're sent across a network, then that needs to happen quickly so that there's small delay to get the data to the other side and using an exclusive OR here is, is one of the fastest things that we can implement for uh, in our computer. So the design was to be very fast. 
It depends upon this algorithm for generating random numbers. And we have a topic on generating random numbers, and it's not as easy as we may think sometimes. Okay? And it will depend upon not having to reuse the key many times. So we will not study stream ciphers yet. When we return to random numbers, we'll look at how to generate random numbers. XOR is easy. So we'll return to that. But the idea, encrypt fast, usually a bit or a byte at a time. If you remember your computer hardware or, or basic computing concepts, you'll remember XOR, exclusive OR. And we'll see that if we encrypt using exclusive OR, the algorithm to decrypt is also an exclusive OR. That is, if we take some value XOR with a plain text and we get the cipher text, to get that plain text back, we simply XOR with that original value that we used. And we'll get the exact uh, correct plain text back. So that's one nice property of XOR. We can use it for encrypt and decrypt. But we're not going to talk about stream ciphers today. We're going to look at the other approach, <coughs> block ciphers. Usually operate on blocks of data, 64 or 128 bits long. And we apply an encryption algorithm on that block of bits, again using a key. And we get a, a block of ciphertext that come out, same length as the input plain text. So we need to look at what is this encryption algorithm. The design of such algorithms was made such that they generally slower, or at least in the past were slower than stream ciphers, uh, but had a few less limitations in terms of the security and the key reuse. And we compare them later. Uh, so block ciphers were really designed for encrypting files. You have a file on your disk, you want to encrypt it. The time to encrypt is not a big issue. You don't want to take, it, take days, but it doesn't matter if it takes one second or half a second. Whereas with a stream cipher, when you're encrypting real-time data, the delay is very important. So the, the design was to be different in delay, the time to take to encrypt. We're going to look at block ciphers today in the next uh, couple of topics, and we'll return to stream ciphers later when we look at random numbers. It turns out today with hardware and software speeds, many block ciphers are about the same speed of stream ciphers anyway. Okay. So you can use block ciphers to do real-time encryption. So we're going to look at block ciphers. And what a block cipher does is if we have a plain text message, let's say a one megabyte file we want to encrypt, we don't encrypt all one megabytes at the time. We split it into B bits of plain text chunks of B bits in length, where B will be a parameter of the algorithm. We'll see the first algorithm of DES, we'll see B is 64 bits. We encrypt the first B bits of plain text and get B bits of ciphertext. And then we encrypt the next B bits of plain text of our file and get some more ciphertext and keep going until we finish all the blocks in the file and we have a set of ciphertext blocks and then we join them together. And the simplest way to join them together is just to concatenate those values. But there are some other ways to join them together. <coughs> so in, in, in this topic, we're going to not focus on encrypting a file, but encrypting B bits at a time. So we'll just look at the algorithm. We take B bits as input, a block. Or N bits. So we say we have an n bit block cipher that takes n bits of plain text in and produces n bits of cipher text out. We also have a key, say a, a key of k bits length. If we have n bits of plain text, then there are two to the power of n possible different plain text blocks. And the, the table down the bottom gives an example of that. If our block length is two bits, just for a simple example, then there are four different blocks that we could have to potentially encrypt. That is, the possible values of plain text are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, if we have a two-bit cipher, a two-bit block cipher. 
If we have a three-bit block cipher, there are eight potential plaintext values that come in, two to the power of n here, that's all. So we'll see DES, for example, is a 64-bit block cipher. It can take two to the power of 64, well, it takes a 64-bit input. There are two to the power of 64 different possible inputs that can come into it. And it produces 64 bits output, which is a ciphertext. For encryption to work, the algorithm that's used needs to be reversible. That is, we need to be able to decrypt. It's no good if we can encrypt, get some ciphertext, and then given the ciphertext, the key and the algorithm, we cannot get the original plain text. We must get the original plain text back. That's what we mean by reversible. And the two tables show an example. The left one is a reversible mapping, just an example, where it, let's say we encrypt using some key, plaintext 00. If the ciphertext is 11 with our algorithm, if we encrypt at a different input, 01, we get ciphertext 10, and so on for the last two. That's a reversible mapping because if you have the ciphertext and you decrypt, using this same mapping, then you'll get a unique plaintext as output. The right-hand table, that's not the case. If this is the mapping, and then you have the ciphertext 01, and you want to decrypt 01, what's the output? What's the plaintext? If you decrypt 01, what's the plaintext using the right-hand table? 10 zero or 11. One, one. We don't know. All right, that's all. Reversible mapping means that we must get a unique value as output. So the, the right-hand table is not a valid mapping, or not a valid encryption algorithm if we do this. So we must have unique values here so we can decrypt. Let's look at the total number of transformations, but we'll use a different example to, to get to that number 2 to the power of n factorial. Let's consider a, a block cipher. Let me bring it up. And I think you have the, the printout. In your lecture notes you have this Example, or if you don't, you will see it's quite simple. An example of an ideal block, two-bit block cipher. So, to to start with something we can write down. Let's say we have a cipher that takes two bits in and produces two bits of plain text of cipher text out. Then, with a two-bit block cipher, there are four possible plain text inputs: zero zero through to one one. So, I've listed the plain text inputs in this left column here under P and when we encrypt what we do is we perform a mapping. We map the plain text to a ciphertext value and that mapping is determined by a key. So what I've listed here and I've had to split it across two, two uh, sets of rows is that for this plain text input on the left, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, a potential mapping is uh, listed under K1, that it's possible if we take plain text, let me get an easier one to see, let's explain the the picture and explain the concept with that. So we have plain text values that come in. What's the cipher text that comes out? Well, here's one potential mapping. So we have some algorithm. We don't know what the algorithm is yet, but it takes plain text in, produces cipher text out. One possible mapping is that we get these values out. If we encrypt plain text 0, 0, ciphertext 00, zero comes out. That's one possible mapping. <coughs> the second column listed under K2 is another possible mapping. We encrypt 00, zero we get a ciphertext out, 00, zero. but if we encrypt plain text 10, 
What comes out is ciphertext 1, 1. That's another possible mapping in that column there. And then I list all possible mappings, and it goes up to the right-hand side. There are 24 different possible mappings. And you see, if you look at each of those mappings, they are different. That is, the ordering of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 differs in all of these 24 possible values. So if we implement a cipher, a very small cipher in this example, which takes two bits in, we could implement it just as a defining these mappings. And what I do... Yep. Sorry, um, I'm just curious from, you know, like the first key... Mm, K1. It maps, it maps the plain text to the encrypted text. Right. And it's exactly the same mapping. Right. How about Right, so the first column, that is under K1, you notice that the ciphertext that comes out is identical to the plain text. It's a valid mapping. So, yes, if you use that mapping all the time, then that's not so good. But in, in theory, that's one of the possible mappings that's, that's valid. So we don't have to subtract one. Right, if, if we were to use this algorithm, we may say there are some mappings that you should not use. All right, we could say the one with K1, that's a special case, don't use it. But in theory, it's one of the potential cases. All right, but yes, you see that it's not a good one if we use it all the time, if we use that. If we have, so one of the 24 here, we know we get the exact same plain text, or the ciphertext is exactly the same as the plain text. If we have a larger block size, we'll see that, yes, again, one of the mappings will be the same but one of many, and the chance of getting that can be very low. The point with this example, there are 24 possible mappings, or 24 arrangements of those four, uh, four values, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And you know that from your basic statistics or high school mathematics, it's the number of permutations, right? With four values, the number of ways we can arrange them it's four factorial. If we had eight values, say a three-bit block cipher, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on, so we had eight values, the number of mappings or arrangements we can have would be eight factorial in that case. Here we have four factorial arrangements, four times three times two times one, 24 arrangements. So what we could do to implement this block cipher is just to say, all right, implement this as a table, a lookup. The mapping is determined by the key we use. So what I say, I've got some plain text, 0, 0 to encrypt. I choose a key. Let's say K5. If I choose K5, then to encrypt 0, 0, what comes out as cipher text is 0, 0. If I chose a different key, K17, for example, what would come out with the same plain text is 1, 1. Right? So the way that we would use this, choose a key, encrypt our plain text, just looking up the table. What's the problem with our small example here with two bits we see there are not many possible arrangements and many of the times in this case one quarter of, of the, the keys produce the same plain text or the cipher text is the same as the plain text that is with keys 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 if I encrypt 0, 0 I still get 0, 0 as output that's not so good okay? we would like the chance of getting the same output as the input to be very low. Here it's 25% chance of getting the same output there. How could we make that chance lower? That is, given a plain text, get a different ciphertext output. Larger block, block size. So and it's hard for me to draw, if there were three bits, then there are eight 
potential values that come in, the number of arrangements is 8 factorial. All right, so there are many different possible arrangements. So the chance of getting uh, choosing one that produces the same output as input is lower. So this suggests that we should use a larger block size. Two bits is too small. We use a larger block size and people have come up to the design. One of the, this is one of the reasons block sizes of 64 bits are used. Okay, it's considered a reasonable trade-off. We'll say that later that we want to keep it small for other reasons. But for security, generally we need a large block size to encrypt. With 64 bits, let's write down those numbers. Here we had a two, the block size was two bits. The number of possible plain text values is four, two to the power of two. And the number of possible arrangements, mappings, was 24. And the mapping can be selected by the key. So in that case, we can say that in the number of possible keys in this one is 24, or f 4 factorial. If we increase the block length to 3, we'd have 8 plain text values and 8 factorial possible arrangements or keys calculator needed 40,320 that is I'd have to list 40,320 columns there instead of the 24 if I want to list all possible arrangements just with a 3-bit block cipher. And if I choose one of those arrangements, well, no, that is the that's the maximum number of possible keys that are available in, in that cipher. There are 40,320 possible keys because the key determines what the mapping is. If we increase the block, si block size, let's say 64 bits, which is a realistic value used today, then the number of possible plain text in that can come in are 2 to the power of 64, which is 19. about 10 to the power of 19, all right? 19 zeros approximately 10 to the power of 19 and the number of keys the number of mappings is 2 to the power of 64 factorial which is approximately factorial my calculator doesn't handle that number okay 10 to the power of 19 factorial, my calculator, my computer cannot calculate that. It's such a big number. My computer can, I think, I tested before, 200 factorial is 10 to the power of 374. 300 factorial, it won't calculate. My calculator is not that powerful. It, it will give up. So 10 to the power of 19 factorial has got no chance. But it's a very big number. So the number of possible keys is very large, which is good. So this is a good block size in that we take 64 bits in, we get 64 bits out. There are many possible keys, and that's what we like in our ciphers. So the brute force attacks, the attacker can't guess a key. So it's good to have many possible keys. So we could design a cipher, what we call an ideal block cipher, by just defining a set of mappings. We design or implement as a table in software or hardware, say, if we have this plain text as input, these 64 bits, and if the user chooses this key, then we look up in the table and we say what comes out is this 64 bits of ciphertext. We'd look up a table in a similar concept to this. 
implementing, and that would be secure. That would be an, uh, an, a suitable cipher to define it as a set of tables from a security perspective. But implementing it is very hard. If we want to have 64-bit blocks, then we have two to the power of 64 possible values. So if we have a table that we need to store, there are 10 to the power of 19 rows in that table, which is, I think, millions of terabytes. If we want to store this table in, in, in memory on a hard disk, then we need millions of terabytes just to store that in our computer. And our computer that wants to encrypt something needs to look up that table of millions of terabytes and then find the right value and that returns the ciphertext. Well, we can't implement that. We need too much storage space and to do the lookup would take too much time. So, we, in theory, we can implement a cipher as a lookup. Define the table of all possible mappings and then look up the ciphertext given the key and the plain text. In practice, if we do it that way, we cannot implement it in reasonable space and reasonable time. Another practical limitation is the key length. This is the number of possible keys. There are 24 unique mappings, therefore we can have a maximum of 24 possible keys. We've said that with symmetric key encryption, user A and user B must know that key. And they both must know the same value, so somehow they need to transfer it. Let's say we've got a magic way to send a, a secret, a key in secret across a network. So we need to send it across the network. How many bits do we need to send? So in the first case, if there are 24 possible keys, what's the key length? How long should a key be in bits? There are 24 different values. How many bits do we need to represent? The key. Not two, not three. There are 24 values. Well, I'd need, if I had four bits in my key, I could represent 16 values, two to the power of four. I'd need five bits. With five bits, I can represent 32 values. I need to be able to represent 24 values. So my key length should be at least 5 bits. If my key length was 5 bits, then I can represent in binary the numbers 0 through to 23. All right. I can encode those decimal numbers in binary. I could say, OK, key, key 0, we encode as a 5-bit number, key 23, or the, the 24th key, we encode as a, a 5-bit number. That is log base 2 of 24. And then we want the ceiling of, well, not the yeah, round that up, essentially. 5 bits. 4 bits is not enough. 5 bits is sufficient to do 32. That's fine. With that cipher, with a 2-bit block si size, we have a 5-bit key necessary. So we could send that 5-bit key to the other user, OK. If it was 3-bit block length, we have how many possible keys? Well, log base 2 of 40,000. Again, I need my calculator. The number of bits needed to represent 40,000 possible values log of 40,320 divided by log of 2, about 15 or 16 bits. Okay, with 16 bits, we can represent 64,000 different values. So that's enough to represent our 40,000 values. With 15 bits, we go up to 32,000 values. Not enough. Again, that's reasonable. That's fine. If my key length is just 16 bits, two bytes. It's very short, two bytes. I can send in a message to someone else as, as the key. And I can store that key on my hard disk. Two bytes takes up almost zero storage on my disk. Fine. Our block size is 64 bits. 
then we have 2 to the power of 64 factorial possible keys to represent that all those values we need approximately well log base 2 of 2 to the power of 64 factorial that's how long the key should be to represent that many values my calculator won't calculate that because it cannot calculate the factorial but the, an approximation or it's a little bit higher but an approximation is that it's about or it's a little bit less than 64 times 2 to the power of 64 n times 2 to the power of n when n is the block length which is what? that is my key when I store it on my disk or when I send it to someone else it must be about 64 times 2 to the power of 64 bits long Sixty-four times two to the power of sixty-four bits long. Convert to bytes. I'll divide by eight. All right. So that was the number of bits. About ten to the power of twenty-one bits in length. Divide by eight to convert to bytes. Divided by ten to the power of twelve gives us what? Terabytes. Gigabytes is 10 to the power of 9. Terabytes is 10 to the power of 12. That's how many terabytes I need. That is, my key that I'm going to use to encrypt should be about 147 million terabytes long. I need to save that key on my disk because I need to remember it so that when I can receive a message and decrypt, and what's more, I need to somehow give that key when I choose it to someone else. Maybe send it across a network or write it on a piece of paper and pass it to them. How do I communicate 147 terabytes to someone else? Not possible again. Our key length is too long. If we want to use this approach of using a table lookup where we just define a mapping based upon the key, then there's a number of practical problems. The key length is far too large. 147 million terabytes. So we need about 147 million hard disks to store your key. And we'll see later a good thing with keys, we should change them quite often. Right? So we need to change them on a regular basis. So it's just not pr practical there. We can't store the table in our hard disk either. So this, is, this approach of using the mapping is called an ideal block cipher. It's the ideal way to do it from a security perspective, but from an implementation perspective, it just won't work. The numbers are too large. Keys too large. The storage space for the table is too large. Any questions on these calculations before we go back to our slides? We calculated, given a block size, how many possible plain text values there are. Fine. How many possible arrangements of those plain text values are there? How many permutations, which determines the number of keys or mappings? And then given a, the number of possible keys, we need to be able to represent that key as a binary number. So we calculated how long should that binary number be to represent one of those keys because somehow we need to get the key to someone else and store it on disk. If the key is too long, like hundred millions of terabytes, then we cannot use this approach. We cannot use a 64-bit block cipher because the key, sp the key length is too large. But if the block size is too small, we have problems in that we'll always get the same block and we get many repetitions. And repetitions are bad when we encrypt because it gives some structure in the output. And we'll see that, uh, some more details of why the block size is too small today. So we want a large block size for security, but we want a small block size to make it practical to have a small key length. 
So an ideal block cipher doesn't quite work. We need different designs. We need a design that allows for a large block size, up to say 64 bits, and allows for a small key length. Maybe again 64, 128 bits. So that was an example of an ideal block cipher where we just map our inputs to outputs. And the example I think is enough. There's a few slides to explain it further, but that example makes the point that we want to have the problems with an ideal block cipher. We want to have a large block size because if you have a small block size, you get many repetitions. You get the same output all the time. And it makes it easier to do attacks if you use a small block size, like two or three bits. But if you use a large block size, we get a very large key. And we can't transfer that to someone else and we can't save it. So implementation becomes a problem. Hence, ideal block ciphers are not used. People have designed different approaches to, to deal with those trade-offs. That's just the, an, another example of ideal block cipher. So people have designed different approaches that try to be just as secure as an ideal block cipher, but much more practical to implement. And there are different designs. But one of the key design approaches was created by a guy called Feistel, <coughs> and he designed a general approach for block ciphers and it's used in a number of different ciphers that are used today or have been used in the last 30 years. It's called the Feistel structure. And we will go through one example of its application in what's called the data encryption standard. So Feistel's idea was to, rather than use an ideal block cipher, allow for a short key, right, 64 bits maybe, 128 bits, but short enough to save on disk and to send to someone but to get the same strength as an ideal block cipher, or close to. And what the design does is take some simple ciphers and applies them multiple times and repeating ciphers using different operations. And we saw with classical ciphers the two operations are transposition and substitution. We look at the Caesar cipher, Visionaire, as a substitution ci cipher. And then the rail fence and rows columns were examples of transposition ciphers. So these two basic operations are used in the Feistel structure where you take, you apply a very simple small cipher, small key length, small block size, and maybe do a substitution. And then you take the output of that and do a transposition. And a transposition is also known as a permutation. We'll see that name used more commonly soon. And then you do it again. Another substitution and another transposition. And I do it multiple times with the idea that the output that comes out, the final ciphertext, is just as secure as if you used an ideal block cipher. We will not go through the design, the general design in detail. We will see the, an example of it when we go through DES. Okay, so there's a few points about the approach of the Feistel structure, but just be aware it was a, a way to design block ciphers and is used in many different block ciphers today. But they have a, a few uh, variations of how they apply it. The key point is it applies substitutions and transpositions repeatedly. Doing that, the idea behind that is to introduce diffusion and confusion. And it's easy to introduce confusion into the lecture, so we will not define them yet. We'll go through an example and then we'll try and explain what diffusion and confusion are. They are concepts that are important in ciphers. So rather than looking at the general Feistel structure, we will go through one example that uses the Feistel structure different schemes have different parameters, different block size, commonly 64 bits or 128 bits, different key lengths, 
64 bits in the past days, now 128 bits and 256 bits are recommended. And the number of times you repeat the substitutions and transpositions, the number of rounds that we go through differs. So we'll see uh, in DES and then in another cipher what those parameters are. And this is a time to highlight a key trade-off in ciphers. We want them to be secure. Our ideal block cipher would be secure if we implemented that. But we want to be able to use them in a convenient manner. Right? So performance is another trade-off and ease of use. So always it will come up. To get more security, we'll usually compromise on performance. That is, it takes longer to encrypt or it's more to store in, in disk, more to transfer across the network. So a key trade-off that we'll have to deal with. We can't just increase the security with no, no losses. So let's look at the data encryption standard, DES. DES is a symmetric block cipher. It takes 64 bits of plain text in and produces 64 bits of ciphertext out. The key length for DES, and this will be uh, a confusing thing that you need to remember, the key length is actually 64 bits, but eight of the bits are not used in the encryption algorithm. So sometimes you'll see the key length of DES referred to as 64 bits, and other times we'll refer to it as 56 bits, because eight bits are sort of unused. So we do take 64 bits in for the key, but we throw away eight of those bits. They're actually used for a parity check. So from a security perspective, there's only 56 bits that the attacker needs to guess. So a brute force attack needs to just guess 56 bits. It's considered one of the most used encryption systems in the world. Even though it's no longer used, it was used for a long time. It was designed in the 1970s in the US uh, by IBM and they developed an algorithm called Lucifer and they had input of the National Security Agency in doing that and eventually became a standard in the US. The National Bureau of Standards or now the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US said this is the algorithm that all government departments must use to encrypt their data and because all the government departments do, all the companies use the same algorithm so that they can interoperate and other countries use it as well. So DES become widely used. The principles of DES are used in other ciphers as well. So we will go through how DES works but we can state now it's no good anymore because the key length is too small. With 56 bits, it's easy to do a brute force attack on it today. In the 1970s, no, a brute force attack wasn't possible. But today, with current hardware and software, then trying all possible keys, it's, it's possible to do that in the matter of, with some hardware, hours or days. So from that perspective, it's not, no longer used. But the same algorithm has been used to make it more secure by using larger key lengths. Triple DES will go through or we'll say that just apply DES three times using three different keys. And some other algorithms also uh, use the DES design. So we're going to go through in detail the, the idea used by DES. The problem is that we can't do any examples on, on by hand with 64 bits. It's hard for me to write down 64 bits and then do an operation on it. It takes too much time and I'll make too many mistakes. So to see how it works, we're going to use an educational version of DES created by some people to just illustrate the concepts called simplified DES, SDES. It's not used in practice. Okay, you, you never use simplified DES, it's just used in teaching so that you can see the idea of how DES works and we can follow through some simple examples. So we'll go through simplified DES, which is really just a, a shrunken version of real DES and then we'll come back to the real DES and say how it differs from simplified DES.
and we'll encrypt some data with simplified deaths. So let's look at the algorithm. Simplified death takes 8 bits of plain text in and 8 bits of ciphertext come out and has a 10-bit key. It's, diff it's longer than the, the plain text block just to make it the, the steps in the algorithm work correctly. And it does some operations with the plain text and gets some intermediate output and then it repeats all of those operations again. So we say it goes through two rounds. Real death goes through 16 rounds. It repeats 16 times. We start with a key and we generate some what we call sub keys or round keys. That is, we'll generate some keys that we'll use in different phases in the encryption. So there's a key generation algorithm. There's an encryption algorithm which we'll go through. The decryption algorithm is essentially the same as encryption, but we go backwards. Right, we'll see that. So what we'll do, we'll go through key generation, use an example, and then encryption to see the different operations used. This tries to capture those three algorithms all at once. In the middle are the steps used to generate keys from our original user chosen key. That is, the user chooses a 10-bit key. Then they apply some steps, which we'll go through what they are. There's P10, Shift, P8, Shift, P8. The output of those two steps are two other keys, which we call two sub-keys or two round keys. K1 and K2 in the diagram. Why do we generate two sub-keys? Because we said the encryption involves two rounds, two, two phases of we'll do something, then repeat it. And we'll use a different sub-key in each round. Real desk does similar. It generates 16 sub-keys. Every round it uses a different sub-key. But you start just with one original key. To encrypt, we take 8 bits of plain text in, we do some operations, IP, F of K using key 1, a swap, the same F of K using key 2, and some last operation, we get ciphertext. To decrypt, we start with the ciphertext and we do the same operations as encrypt almost. Encrypt, we start with this first IP operation. We'll explain what IP stands for shortly. To decrypt, we do the same. We apply the same function. We apply the same swap here, the same function again, and the inverse operation, and we get plain text. If you look closely, the blocks for encrypt and decrypt are the same. IP, F of K, swap, F of K, the inverse IP. The only difference is that we use K1 and K2 in a different order. For encrypt, we use K1 then K2. To decrypt, we first use K2 and then K1, where those values are the same. Let's go through it with an example. We'll, use, we'll refer to these slides as we go through the operation, so I'll flick back through them. The example we're going to go through is this one. That is, we're going to take those 8 bits of plain text. The user chooses the key, which is a 10-bit value. I just chose a random key here. And we're going to encrypt that plain text, and hopefully, uh, at the end of the example, we'll end up with those 8 bits of ciphertext. That's what we'll try and do. I'm going to write it down. We'll go through each step. You can write it down, but if you look, I hope I included at the end of your at the end of the slides, a printout of the example. Maybe I'll have a look. Because it's, sometimes we, it's easy to make a mistake in writing down the bits. On page 95, you'll see the, the example we go through.
The first thing we do, before we do any encrypting, we have to generate the sub-keys or the round keys. We start with our original key, our 10-bit value, and we're going to, from that, generate two other keys and then use them in the encryption and decryption. So let's do the key generation steps first. So we start with the user chosen key. We start with what well, the key will denote as K. And the value that we chose, those 10 bits, have we chose them randomly. 1, 0. And just to uh, make it easier to see the, the bits, I'll have a little bit of spacing. So that, that's the key that the user chooses. It's the same one on the slides, I hope. Yes. OK, 10-bit value. And we need to generate two sub-keys from that. And the way that we do that is using these operations, P10, Shift, P8, Shift, P8. So we need to explain what they are. Or in more detail, shown here. So this is the key generation algorithm. We take 10 bits in, and the way that the uh, arrows are marked, they show the number of bits we'll do in each will pass between each step. We apply an operation called P10. P stands for permutation. In this, We do a permutation of those bits. Permutation is another word for transposition or rearrange. So what P10 means, we take 10 bits in and then we mix them up. That's We do a permutation. And that way that we mix them up is defined and fixed. We always mix them according to the same rules. So P10 is actually defined. We'll see it on the other slides. It says move this bit to this position, this second bit to this position. So when you see a P, later we'll see P8. It's also a permutation. Remember from classical ciphers, substitutions and permutations. LS is left shift. So in binary, we can shift the bits left. LS1 is do a left shift by one position. Take your bits, shift them to the left, where the leftmost bit becomes the rightmost bit. It wraps around. So like in hardware, we can do a left shift on our bits. But the left shift takes five bits in and produces five bits out. So in fact, what we do is the output of P10, we split into two halves. P8 is a permutation. The shape of this box means that we're going to take 10 bits in and produce 8 bits out. All right, it's going to throw away two of the bits, but rearrange the rest. Left shift 2 is do a left shift by two positions to the left. Take our five bits, move them to the left. So left shift is a permutation as well. P10 and P8, the two P8s are permutations. Let's go through them. So we're just mixing up the bits. P10, I have to jump back between the slides, is defined here. So it's defined in the algorithm. It's fixed. It never changes. The attacker knows what it is. The way to read it, we have 10 bits that come in. We label them. We can think the first bit, the second, up to the 10th bit that come in, in order. What comes out? The first bit moves to this position. The third bit of the input becomes the first bit on the output. The tenth bit on the input moves to the sixth position. That's all that's defining here. So we take ten bits in and we mix them up. How do we mix them? According to this permutation. So let's do that on our ten bits. We've got 10 bits coming in. In this case, we'll, we'll make it clear. We'll say that let's label them. 1, 2, 3. So there are our 10 bits that come in. When we apply the permutation P10, 
using the key as input, P10, it's going to produce bits that come out and from that slide. The third bit on input is going to move to the first position. The third bit on input moves to the first position, so that is a bit one will be the first bit in the output. The fifth bit moves to the second position. We see the five here means the fifth bit from input becomes the second bit that comes out. And the fifth bit was a zero. Zero comes out here. And we keep doing that for the, the rest. What's the next one? Two, is it? Bit two becomes the third one, which was a zero. So we're just mixing up these bits. Bit seven which was also a zero. Bit four we will only draw this once, we will not do it for all the permutations, but just to highlight the approach. Bit 4 was a 0. Three, five, two, seven, four, and then the 10th, 10, 1, 9, 8, 6. Bit 10, 9, bit 1 from all over here, gets a bit messy, 8 and 6. Bit 10 was a 0, bit 9 was a 1, bit 1 was a z 1, bit 8 is a 0, and bit 6 is a 0. Please check that I'm, when I make a mistake, let me know. What we're doing is mixing those first 10 bits up. Defined manner. Defined by P. Same way that the rail fence for the rows column cipher mixed up our letters. The rail fence that we wrote them in three, three rows, for example, and read off. It just rearranges the, or permutates the bits. Uh, yeah? So, um, there were different combinations with that, right? For each and operation. This is just one. No. P, P10 is fixed. So, P10 is defined as part of, in this case, simplified DES. And the same in real DES, there's a P. I can't remember the number, but there's a, a permutation which is defined and always used this way. So the, whenever we take these 10 bits in, we'll always, in the first step, get these 10 bits. We'll always mix them this way. So we see that's very simple. Yeah. And you may question, well, is that secure? All right, we're just mixing up, and the attacker knows how we mix them up. So a very simple operation, but we need to question, is it secure? Well, we'll see on its own is not secure because the attacker can, uh, if they know the output, they know the permutation, they can easily find the input. They can go backwards. But when we combine it later with some other operations, the substitutions, we'll see that the final output is considered secure because the attacker cannot go backwards. So this is the idea of combined simple operations. Yep. I switched them, did I? One and nine. Right. Okay. One comes before nine. Right. Okay. Correct. I put nine before one, but I was lucky in that they both bit ones. All right. So good. Find my mistakes.
we get these 10 bits, we do the next phase of the key generation, which is we split it into two halves, the left half and the right half, and in each half, we'll have five bits, do a left shift by one position on each half. Left shift, just rotate the, the bits, wrap around where necessary. That is now we consider it in two halves, two five-bit inputs. We'll do a left shift by one position on each half. Left shift just means that the, the second bit becomes the first bit. The third bit, the second bit, and the first bit on input will wrap around and become the last bit. So note that we do it just on those five bits, not on all ten. And then we do a left shift on the second half. So we move the bits to the left, so it'll be one, one, zero, zero, that's these four bits, and the first zero will end up at the, the right hand side. So now we have uh, two five bit outputs. What's next? Join those two 5-bit values, pass them into P8. P8 is another permutation. So we're just rearranging the bits. Left shift is also a permutation. What is P8? I'll go in the right direction. Sorry, wrong way. P8 is defined here. It's actually select and permutate. That is, we start with 10 bits in, 1 through to 10. Bits 1 and 2 are discarded. We just take the last 8 bits and rearrange them according to this fixed definition of P8. So let's do P8 on those 10 bits. You do P8 and tell me the answer. The first two bits are going to be discarded and the last eight bits are going to be rearranged. And that the sixth bit, then the third bit, then the seventh bit will come first. Six, three, and seven. And if you keep going, 4, 8, 5, 10, 9. Bit 4, 8. Bit 5 is a 1. And 10 and 9 are both zeros. That is the output of P8. And importantly, that is sub-key K1, or the round key K1. It's going to be used in round one of our encryption algorithm. So that's the, the value of K1. Let's keep going. So we just did P8, and the output of P8 is K1. But what we do to get K2 is we take the previous inputs to P8, do a left shift by two positions, and then do P8 to get K2. So let's quickly do that. So we'll keep drawing here. We take this five values and do a left shift by two positions. So we're going to continue with these five and do a left shift by two, and that's easy. This one will move to the middle position. Left shift by one, two positions. And similar, we'll do a left shift by two positions on the right five bits. And we have three zeros and the two ones will end up at the end. 
and then take those 10 bits and do P8 again. The first two bits will be discarded. We rearrange the last eight bits and see what you get. P8 63748519 bit 6 bit 3 bit 7 and 4 bit 8 5 and the last two bits 10 and 9 and that is K2 All we've done is taken our 10-bit user chosen key and rearranged it according to some fixed algorithm to get two sub keys. Not so hard. That was the easy part. And note that the operations we did were all permutations or all transpositions. There were no substitutions there. We always just took the same bits in and moved them around. Left shift is a, is a permutation, P8 and P10 are permutations. We're going to use K1 and K2 in both the encryption and they are used also in the decryption. So if you receive ciphertext and you need to decrypt, if you have the same key, you'll generate the same two subkeys, K1 and K2. So we'll use it together. So let's do an encryption using our plain text from the example. And let's have a look at the encryption algorithm. Here's the details. We've got 10 minutes to finish our encryption. Well, we'll get started. But as an overview, we start with 8 bits of plain text. We do an initial permutation. IP means initial permutation. So again, it's a permutation. It's fixed. Then this dark gray box is denoted f of k. So together we say that's some function. We take the 8 bits in and produce 8 bits output. This is what we call our round function. This is one round of our algorithm. And the input to that round will be k1. When we finish that round, we swap the halves, sw, swap or switch. That is, we have two halves of, of bits and we'll swap them and then we do the same round function in the, the second grey box that's here. So exactly the same inside the grey boxes so they're the same functions here but we in the second round we use K2. When that's finished we do the inverse initial permutation. In, initial permutation is defined, the inverse we'll see what that is, so you'll see what it is and then we get 8 bits of ciphertext out. So what we'll do in the example is we will get to, we'll go through the round function once, we'll get to here and then I'll leave it to you to do the round function the second time. Take 8 bits in, an initial permutation and then we split the 8 bits into two halves. We'll take the right half and then apply these more operations on that right half. EP, XOR and others. Let's try. We'll use K1 and K2 during this. Our plain text, I'll just denote as P, the data that the user wants to encrypt, we've chosen some values. Eight bits of plain text, 
we do an initial permutation and like P8 and P10 that is also defined where is it here it is initial permutation just a, a permutation where the second bit becomes the first the sixth bit becomes the second and so on rearrange those bits Two six three one bit two bit six bit three and bit one and then four eight five seven bit four eight five and seven The initial permutation is done before the, the main function and the opposite is done at the end just before we get the ciphertext. In, in real desk, similar, there's an initial permutation, you do 16 rounds and then you finish with an inverse initial permutation. We split it into two halves, so we'll note that right, we'll talk about the left half and the right half. We will not use the left half yet. We will take the right half and do some operations on that. What do we do? The right half, the right four bits, so the, the line through it with the four means we've got four bits here. We apply these steps. EP, expand and permutate. Four bits in, eight bits out. So we're going to duplicate the bits, but also a rearrangement at the same time. Expand and permutate. We take four bits in, one, two, three, four, and what comes out, four, one, two, three, two, three, four, one. So each bit is duplicated on the output of EP. Four, one, two, three. No, we're working on the right four bits, one, zero, zero, one. Four, one, two, three, bit four, bit one, two and three, four, one, two, three. And with those same four bits on the right half, two, three, four, one. Bit two. Three, four, and one. Bit one. This is actually the, the start of our function. So here was the start of that grey box where we do f that function using k one as input after the expand and permutate we've got eight bits we XOR with the key eight bits exclusive OR with K1 K1 we generated in the previous algorithm so we'll write down K1 and do an XOR and here's our first different operation key generation use permutate left shift which is also a permutate Expand and permutate is a permutate. It's a rearrangement of bits. XOR is a substitution. All right, we're not just rearranging the bits. We're replacing bits with other potential bits. Okay, so this is our first substitution, exclusive OR here. So XOR, our value with K1. So if we remember K1 from before, K1 was 1010 zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, and we XOR those values. Exclusive OR, what do you get? Remember your exclusive OR. 
Okay. If they are the same, you get zero. If the bits are different, you get one. Are the same, we get zero. Same, different, different, same, same, different, different, different. We get our eight bits out. And then we split that again into two four bit values. So that was a substitution. Well, how do we know? Well, it's definitely not a permutation because the input were these eight bits, were four ones and four zeros. The output has five ones and three zeros. So we didn't end up with the same bits just mixed up. Sometimes it's hard to tell. It was some replacement of, of bits there. So that was a substitution operation. And the next operation is also a substitution, and we use S boxes. In the same way that the permutations were defined, we defined, we defined using a special technique a way to replace some bits with other bits to a substitution. And these are a key part in, in the real desk design and even in other uh, ciphers. What we do, we start, consider the first four bits, 0, 1, 1, 0. I'll write it again over here. We, and it, let's look at the slide where it's defined, the S boxes. So where are, we're up to, we just did the XOR. We've got four bits on the left, four bits on the right. The four bits on the left are going to be fed into S box S0. The four bits on, on the right are fed into S box S1. We're going to power on through for the next 10 minutes and finish this example, and then we'll take a break after that. Let's do the S boxes. S0, and it's defined on this slide. We have four bits in. Think bit 1, 2, 3, 4. The S boxes, S0 and S1, are matrices, and they are defined. All right, so four by four matrices. They are fixed. Everyone knows what the values are. And the way that we use them is that the first and the last bit of the input determines the row of the matrix. And the second and third bit determine the column of the matrix. We look up that element, and that's the output. Let's consider with our example the row, the first and last bit, 0, 0. Row equals zero, zero. Column, the second and third bits, one, one. Or you can think row in decimal zero, column three. If we index our matrix starting at zero, so we have zero, one, two, three rows, zero, one, two, three columns, then we look up the element which is in row zero, column three. Row zero, zero in binary, column one in binary. Look it up in the matrix of S1. What do you get as output? Oh, sorry, S0, S0. Row 0, column 3, S0, row 0, the top row, column 3, the last column, output 1, 0 this value. Note that we index starting at 0. Row 0, 1, 2, 3, column 0, 1, 2, 3, row 0, column 3, output 1, 0. What? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Can we step out? No, yep. Can you tell us row 0? Uh, our, okay, so our input here we have 0, 1, 1, 0. The, the, 
the rule is that yes, the first and last bit tell us it's which row number. Row zero zero in binary or in decimal row zero. So I convert. And the column is the middle two bits, one one. Or if I convert to decimal, one one is three. Okay, so depends on how you want to think about it, in binary or decimal. So in in decimal, that will be 0 and 3. Right, we just convert. So, row 0, column 3, which is the fourth column, we start index at 0. The output will be this element. And it's fixed. It's always that value for that element, 1, 0. Do it for S1. With S1, you take the other four bits. You take these four bits, apply into S1, the different matrix, and see what you get. With the S1, we take the input is 0, 1, 1, 1, row 0, 1. The first and last bit, column, second and third bit, 1, 1, or in decimal, 1 and 3. Look it up in S1. Row 1, column 3. Row 1, which is the second column, column 3, the last column, 1, 1 comes out, this element. We've not discussed the design of them yet. We'll come back when we talk about this. Why is it like this? We have four bits. We're at this point. We pass into P4. Rearrange those four bits. P4 is defined. 2, 4, 3, 1. Rearrange those four bits. We have four bits, one, two, three, four, rearrange, where we have two, four, three, one, bit two, four, three, and one. So we treat those four bits together, we get zero, one, one, one. XOR with the left half from the original input. Where'd it go? That is, all of this started with these four bits. We haven't done anything with these four bits, so let's use them now. Take these and XOR with our four bits that we have currently. That's the left half. This was the right half expanded and permutated here. One, sorry. One, one, zero, one. Sorry, one, yeah, one, zero, one, zero. XOR. Exclusive or one one zero one. Almost there. Grab the right half. Grab this half, the original right half. One zero zero one.
Now we have two 4-bit values. Swap them. Swap the sides. Actually, this is a swap operation, which is quite simple. These four bits will become the last four bits, and these four bits become the first four. That was actually And then I think we've done all operations necessary. Let's summarize what we did, then we'll have a break. We started with the initial permutation. We took the right four bits, expand and permutate XOR with the key K1, Use the two S boxes, S0 and S1. We get four bits out. Apply permutation P4. XOR that with the original left half. We get four bits out. Take the original right half. And we're actually finished the round now. We have eight bits that come out of the round. Before we do the next round, we swap those two halves. And then we repeat it all again, starting from the expand and permutate. You see what's inside the grey box is the same. We do the same steps, but we'll use K2. We'll get 8 bits out. We'll do the inverse initial permutation and get ciphertext. So we got to this point. To finish, what you do is now you start the set the round function using K2. When you finish that round function, Then you'll do the inverse initial permutation and you'll end up with 8 bits, the ciphertext, and the 8 bits you should get just by luck, the two halves are the same. And to give you a hint, so we can have a break. The inverse initial permutation is your homework. Find it. What is it? And to give you a hint, the end of that function, the input, is this. the end of function, the round function using K2, you'll get these 8 bits, then you'll do the inverse initial permutation and then you'll end up with a ciphertext. So your homework, if you don't understand the steps, you can do them for round 2, which is exactly the same as round 1, and then do the inverse initial permutation and we get ciphertext. A lot of details there, let's have a break and then maybe in uh, what, at 10.50, 10.50, we'll come back and, and talk about why it's designed this way, the advantages and disadvantages, in 15 minutes.